Hi guys, Olive here. Here today to talk about the books I read for nonfiction November 2020. I am very pleased to report that I finished most of the books that I had placed on my nonfiction November TBR. I did not finish all of them because I got quite distracted by a very big book toward the end of the month, but that big book ended up being a five star read for me. So I can't be that torn up about it. I'm going to start off this wrap up by discussing my feelings about our group read, our first ever group read for nonfiction November, which was primarily led by the lovely Jill from The Book Bully. Together we read The Yellow House by Sarah M. Broom, which is both a memoir and the author's family story. The author begins this book by giving a history of her family's neighborhood in New Orleans, which is New Orleans East, and she gives a very detailed family background. It takes a long while for the author to even make an appearance in her own book, but once she does, she talks about growing up in the family home, which is the yellow house in question, and she speaks about what it was like to lose that home to Hurricane Katrina. She discusses the period of her life spent living and working in East Africa, but then she also talks about how she moved back home again to New Orleans and worked in the mayor's office. And there's even a portion of this book where she's talking about everything that was going on in her life. As she was researching the early sections of this book, so all of the family details and the history of New Orleans, she talks about what was going on in her life during that time which was a little bit meta for me. I liked this book overall. I gave it three stars. I think my main problem with it was that it seemed like the author lacked restraint when writing it. I imagine it must be difficult as an author of a memoir or as an author of a family story like this one to have all of these details and all of these life events laid out before you and knowing which ones to include versus which ones to exclude. I am sure that there must be a compulsion to just include everything, but there are a lot of details that need to be excluded because they don't lend anything to the main story that you're trying to tell. There was a lot of that going on in this book. There was just a lot of extra detail that I just didn't need. It's not like I didn't enjoy hearing about some of it. it just wasn't adding anything to the central story. Also, I felt like there needed to be a greater emphasis placed on the concept of home. I think she needed to underline that more clearly throughout the text, because I think it laid at the center of a lot of the discussion she was trying to have, and yet I don't think she brought it out as much as she could have. So those are just my general thoughts on this book. If you would like to hear a more thorough take, Jill from The Book Bully did a great chatty video about this book. She noticed so many things that I did not pick up on. She read it very closely since she was leading the discussion. I will link her video down in the description box below and up in the cards. I highly recommend you watch it. If you joined in on this group read and you have not yet left your comments in the Goodreads thread that we have going for this, I will put that link for you in the description box as well. Please feel free to let us know what you thought about this book. We would love to hear from you. I'm going to leave that thread up until next year's Nonfiction November. So whenever you get around to finishing this book, whenever you collect your thoughts, it'll be there waiting for you. But off of my TBR for the challenges that we set for Nonfiction November, I read Driving Wild Black by Gretchen Soren. This is a history of the experience of driving as a Black American. So in the early years, what cars were deemed acceptable for them to own and drive, to the dangers of long road trips, then to the role of the automobile during the Great Migration, and all the way up to the modern day with police brutality during traffic stops. This book was just extremely well done. I thought the structure of it was perfect. The author will sometimes open sections or bridge sections with some very brief personal anecdotes, which I thought really brought a lot of this historical information to life. I thought this book and the PBS documentary that was based off of this book that I watched after I finished the book, they both were incredibly illuminating and important, but a lot of the content, it's just horrifying. Just the fact that not all that long ago in America, a Black family who wanted to take a family vacation or who wanted to take a simple road trip, they would feel it necessary, rightly so, to pack 
everything they could ever imagine needing on that trip, meaning every single meal and supplies in case they needed to sleep in the car because there was no guarantee that hotels or restaurants would accommodate them. That's why there was a travel guide called the Green Book that was developed over a number of years and continuously updated. It was based off of trial and error. It was based off of people's own personal experiences. It listed businesses that would accommodate Black travelers. There's a whole history of the Green Book within this book, and it is also why the cover of Driving While Black is green, which I thought was really clever. As an American, it is so hard to wrap my head around the fact that this stuff was going on just a generation or two ago. And because of that fact, I think it is incredibly important to learn this history, to know this history, to confront this history. So that's part of the reason why I recommend this book. But the other reason is that it is just a really, really well done work of history. And then during November, the organizers of the Pushkin House Russian Book Prize reached out to me and sent me an e-copy of the 2020 winner, which was The Return of the Russian Leviathan by Sergei Medvedev. This is a collection of micro essays all about Russia's current geopolitical situation. I also had two other books on Russia on my nonfiction November TBR. The first of those two was Stalin's Meteorologist by Olivier Rolin. This is a book all about a formerly celebrated Soviet meteorologist who was falsely accused of counter-revolutionary activity. He was imprisoned and later executed. And Secondhand Time by Svetlana Alexeyevich, which is an oral history of the last generation of Soviet people and all of the complicated and often contradictory feelings that people have about the collapse of the empire. Because I was reading these three books around the same time and because I noticed a lot of overlap between the titles, I decided to make a review video in which I discussed all three of them. If you would like to see that video, I will link it for you in the description box below and up in the cards. The next book I read for Nonfiction November is one that I was very kindly sent by the publisher. That book is Stephen Hawking by Leonard Lawnow. This is partially a biography of the famous theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking, but it's also part memoir of the author's relationship with Stephen Hawking, first as his co-writer, but ultimately as his friend. Hawking was actually the one who reached out to Mlaw and Al because he liked his work and he wanted help writing a shorter, more accessible version of his famous book, A Brief History of Time. So the two would go on to co-write A Briefer History of Time as well as one other book. And through the years of working together, they developed a friendship. In the book, the author gives his own personal experiences of working with Stephen Hawking and he also gives a lot of biographical information about him. And he also talks about a lot of the theories that made Stephen Hawking famous. And he does his best to make those understandable. I will admit that physics is not my strongest subject and I highly doubt it ever will be, but I really liked the way the author described things in this book. I felt like I could at least wrap my mind around the concepts, which felt like progress. I also really appreciated the opportunity to learn more about Stephen Hawking. It turns out I actually didn't know a whole lot about him, so it was nice to learn about him through reading this book. And of course, it was really nice seeing the working relationship between the two physicists eventually develop into a friendship. Of course, that's always heartwarming to see. But I did keep getting this nagging feeling as I was reading that this story probably would have been better suited to be an extended essay in a magazine. Ironically enough, I felt it could have been briefer. And for that reason, I gave it three stars. But there was a different story of friendship that really did go the distance for me. And it was in a book that I reviewed for the Christian Science Monitor this month. That was Our Last Season by Harvey Ayrton. The author of this book is a sports writer. He had a column in the New York Times for a long while. And this is his memoir in which he discusses his decades long friendship with a New York Knicks super fan. This super fan, Michelle, started out as a source for the author's stories because her season ticket seats were located directly behind the Knicks bench. But by the end of her life, she and the author had grown as close as family. I loved this book so much. I was so excited to give this one a rave in the monitor. If you'd like to read my review, I will link it for you in the description box below. I also had a second review appear in the Christian Science Monitor this month. I reviewed Cassius X by Stuart Cosgrove. This is a micro history focusing on a window of time in the life of Muhammad Ali before he became Muhammad Ali. I would say most people probably know that the boxer Muhammad Ali started life as Cassius Clay Jr., but I think few 
fewer people would know that there was actually a period of time in his life where he went by Cassius X privately during his conversion to Islam. And this is a book about that period in his life and what all else was going on in his life at the time, which was a lot. He was becoming an icon during that time. I found this book fascinating, but I did notice one major flaw that kind of got in the way. If you'd like to hear more about this book, I will link my review down below. And as my classic work of nonfiction for the month, I finally picked up A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf, which is more or less an extended essay about how women need money of their own and a space of their own in order to have the freedom to write fiction. I don't know why it never occurred to me before reading this book that women like Jane Austen likely would have had to write in the family's main room because they didn't have a room of their own to go into, shut the door, and just focus they would have to write in that main room where they would most certainly be interrupted. Virginia Woolf also talks about how women of the past were not able to travel in the same way that white men of means did, and thus women's worldviews and their sources of inspiration would have been limited. I had heard this book spoken about so much over the years that I wasn't really in a rush to pick it up because I felt like I already got it. I already got the point. I already knew what her arguments were going to be. But I will admit that I could not have been more wrong. I thought this was fascinating. There was so much in here that I did not expect to be discussed. She made amazing points and she's incredibly sassy. So of course I love that. My only nitpicky complaint is that I'm still struggling to see what the point of the first chapter was. Maybe it's just that I need to go back and reread it. Maybe then everything will come together. But as of right now, I don't think that first chapter needed to exist. But A Room of One's Own actually served as a pretty perfect preamble to a book I read shortly thereafter called Red Comet, The Short Life and Blazing Art of Sylvia Plath by Heather Clark. This is a new 1100 page long, comprehensive and meticulously researched biography of the poet and author Sylvia Plath. I absolutely loved this book. I was reading it in every spare moment I had over like a four to five day period, which included Thanksgiving. The whole week, I felt like I was in a fever dream, just drifting in and out of Sylvia Plath's world. It got weird. I gave this book its own review here on my channel if you want to hear why I thought it was so brilliant, if you want to hear why it sucked me in the way that it did. I will link that video review for you in the description box below and up in the cards. A book I read for Nonfiction November that I liked much less was Avoid the Day by J. Kirk. This is a memoir in two parts. In the first part, the author is trying to track down a missing manuscript from the Hungarian composer Bela Bartok. And in the second, he's on an eco cruise in the Arctic. And he and some friends of his who are also on this cruise are filming a horror movie aboard the ship. And they are making up the plot as they go along. I knew going into this book that it was going to be a risky selection because I don't always like things that are weird. And I normally don't like things that could be considered postmodern. And this has both of those things going on in it. But I really liked how it started out. The author gives a lot of biographical information about Bella Bartok. He talks about how the composer used folk music to inspire his classical music. And he describes the composer as this pale vampiric creature. His descriptions were so intriguing. But then the author comes into the picture. And I'm not sure I've ever liked an author's portrayal of themselves less than in this book. First of all, he admits right away that he's on drugs, he has a drinking problem, and there are lapses in his memory. But at least he's honest about that. So that's not the thing I disliked about him. The thing I did dislike about him is the fact that he is so incredibly rude to people who are kind enough to give him their time to agree to be interviewed. There is one scene in this book where the author shows up late to an interview. I think he says he's about 15 minutes late, but then won't even start the interview until he runs down the street to get himself a cup of coffee. The guy who was supposed to be interviewed understandably walks out while this author is down the street at Starbucks and this author has the audacity to act confused about why the guy walked out. But the moment I had really had enough of this author comes later on in the book when he starts insulting the physical appearance of someone with dementia. 
Let me be clear at this juncture, I understand that the author was attempting to use language to conjure the grotesque throughout this book. It's not a case of me missing the point. I see the point. I still find it unforgivably rude. Making art does not give you permission to be a complete jerk. There's next to no transition between the two different sections. These are really just two incomplete stories mushed together to create one book and earn a paycheck, I guess. I mean, by the time the second half rolled around, I could not have cared less what was going to happen to this guy because I had grown to dislike him so much in the first half. I really hate to give this book this kind of review because the publisher was kind enough to send it to me, but I really have to be honest. I mean, if you like postmodern things, this might still be for you, but it's getting a thumbs down from me. But I would like to end this wrap up on a good note. So the final book I will talk about is Diary of a Young Naturalist by Darren McNulty. This is a year long diary that the author kept when he was only 14 years old. In this book, he discusses his personal love of nature. He talks talks about his frustration with the callous disregard that people show the natural worlds. And he talks about what it's like to be a teenager with autism. I was when I first finished this book and still am in a state of disbelief that someone so young wrote a book this beautiful. He transcribes his innermost thoughts with an ease that seems practiced, but it obviously comes natural because he is so young. I did a full video review of this book and I will link that for you in the description box below and up in the cards if you'd like to hear more about it. So those were all the books I read for Nonfiction November, but before I conclude the video, I wanna take a moment and say a big thank you to everyone on Team Nonfiction November this year, Sabrina, Natalie, Jill, and Andrea. Thank you so, so much for your help. I could not have made this year's event what it was without you. We were able to be on more platforms than we ever have been before, and we were able to do more with each of them because we worked as a team. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to everyone who joined in or even just provided support on the sidelines. I know this was a very taxing month in an already very taxing year, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate you dedicating the time and the brain space to reading some great nonfiction. Coordinating this event requires so much work. I think it's a lot more work than people would initially realize. It consumes about three months of my life every single year, and by the time December rolls around, I am absolutely exhausted. But getting to see all of the excitement about nonfiction during November, seeing people discover a love of nonfiction, discover a new side of themselves as readers, getting to learn about new nonfiction books and new creators of nonfiction content, it is always worth it. So thanks again for your participation and your support. I hope you had a good time. I certainly did. I do ask for your patience in advance as I take some time to catch up on comments and DMs and whatever other communication people sent my way. I fell behind during the month of November as I always do, but I will be attempting to get up to date before the turn of the year. If you have any comments or questions for me about any of the books I discussed in this video or about Nonfiction November, please feel free to utilize the comment section below. But if you would like to reach out to me somewhere other than YouTube, I am on a variety of different places on social media and the links to all of my profiles will be in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video. Bye.